uh, and welcome to participants in uh, the World Bank's Fragility Forum. Today's discussion will be on Afghanistan and is entitled Afghanistan Crossroads. Today, after four decades of conflict, Afghanistan finds itself at yet another of its many critical junctures. A number of factors are in play at the moment. The first is the US Taliban February 29th troop withdrawal agreement, signaling a phasing out of US and NATO forces in Afghanistan. Uh, the second factor is continued violence and a pattern of Taliban battlefield and territorial gains, which has been underway now for several years. Third factor is the question of unity on the Afghan government side, uh, despite the recent power sharing agreement between President Ghani and Dr. Abdullah, uh, and its unpredictable impact on the peace talks that should begin soon with the Taliban. The fourth factor uh, is the uncertain donor commitment to the future financing of the Afghan state, uh, a state which is unusually donor dependent. Uh, in 2018, for example, fully 75% of Afghanistan's public expenditures were financed by donors. Fifth, and not inconsiderable, is the impact of COVID-19 on the Afghan economy and possibly on future external support. Uh, and I could also add a sixth factor, uh, reactions of the regional and global powers, Pakistan, Russia, Iran, China, India, Saudi Arabia, to a diminishing US interest in Afghanistan. Today's panel is going to walk you through some of these issues and will, I'm sure, help shed light on what we might expect in the coming months and years. At the back of our minds, as donors, is the upcoming donor pledging conference scheduled for this November uh, and the replenishment of the Afghanistan Reconstruction Trust Fund, the ARTF, uh, which is the principal pooled on budget donor financing instrument. Uh, we have an excellent group for you today. Uh, I will very quickly introduce them to you. Uh, first is uh, Nahid Sarabi, who's on audio. Uh, previously Deputy Minister of Finance for Policy in the Afghan government uh, until just two months ago. Second is Dr. Orzala Ashrif Namat, who is Director of the Afghan Research and Evaluation Unit. Uh, third uh, is Graham Smith, a former journalist and formerly the International Crisis Group's Senior Analyst for Afghanistan, uh, and finally, Tobias Haq, uh, the World Bank's senior country economist for Afghanistan. Uh, my name is Nigel Roberts. I'm a former World Bank staff member, and I'm currently the principal consultant uh, working with the United Kingdom's Overseas Development Institute uh, in its Afghanistan program, which is entitled Lessons for Peace, uh, which aims to bring pertinent advice and global experience to Afghanistan's uh, international donor community. Uh, the way we propose to conduct the session this morning is that, that I will uh, pose four main questions to our panelists, uh, and they will answer those. And following that, if, the time, if time permits, uh, I'll draw in questions that today's audience uh, is submitting online. So with no further ado, uh, let me go to my first question. Uh, and it, it, it goes like this. What can we expect in the coming months, given all of the uncertainties that, that I've just mentioned? I'm going to start by asking uh, Dr. Neymar, uh, and then uh, asking Graham to follow, commenting in their case on the political situation and the peace process, uh, I'll then turn to Ms. Sarabi and to Tobias 
let us speak about the economy. So, Orzala, could you start for us, please? Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, good afternoon, good day, everyone. It's a pleasure to be a panelist in this Fragility Forum. Um, um, to start with, um, uh, what Afghanistan is experiencing now, I would say that, uh, and what, what is expected ahead of us, I would start with following to your opening remarks, Nigel, with um, what you mentioned about the follow-ups from the US-Taliban deal. Uh, there has been some developments in this regard in terms of, you know, one of the preconditions for an intra-Afghan dialogue that is supposed to happen uh, as soon as the uh, uh, prisoners exchange or prisoners release more specifically is over. So the Taliban side expected 5,000 prisoners to be released in exchange with 1,000 uh, in national um, uh, army or ANDSF forces, Afghan National uh, Security and Defense Forces being released. Uh, there is an interesting sort of uh, point here in terms of the differences of 5,000 5, versus 1,000, and that's to do more with the smaller number of alive um, ANDSF forces that the Taliban are holding, because the rule, uh, and according to media and according to research and studies for the Taliban is that as soon as they discover the national ID card or any um, government card with anyone, uh, of the young Afghans traveling around the country, they will kill them. They will not hold them as prisoners or anything. So that's one point that really hardly spoken about even by the government forces, but government people or leaders. Uh, so, but despite that, due to the pressure from the international community, over 4,000 um, Taliban prisoners have been released. There is a number that is a uh, sort of uh, still remaining around 600 and there are some concerns and considerations from the government side that uh, that uh, they have sort of slowed down on that. Uh, the point is that despite this being developing, what we don't see is very serious signs of this moving ahead with the intra-Afghan dialogue, uh, which also has another factor here, which is lack of uh, consensus, uh, proper or meaningful consensus among the political elites in Kabul. Unfortunately, we are also doomed on this part because our presidential election took really long uh, to finalize the results and that followed with some sort of an agreement that so far is, is materialized in theory, but not in practice. The High Council of Reconciliation is still not formed. There are discussions and debates about who will be the deputies, who will be the members of this High Council, and that also slowed down the process. The tragedy of Afghanistan's reality is that while these political processes are taking really long time because of you know, lack of consensus and because somebody is not happy with the power sharing and so forth, and these somebodies are always the political elite, the bloodshed is worse than ever. There are suicide bombings, there are coordinated attacks, there are IED attacks that are taking dozens of lives every day. Unfortunately, in the last uh, uh, few months, since October um, 2019, uh, over 400 people, uh, casualties were there with over 170 killed and um, uh, 270 or so uh, you know, injured uh, according to Human Rights uh, Commission numbers. These could be higher because sometimes people are killed and being targeted and they are not counted because they are not registered in a hospital and so forth. So the current situation post the US Taliban deal, what we can see is that violence has intensified over Afghans. These Afghans being civilian, being also Afghan national security forces. They are all targeted, you know, blanketly, like before, no changes seen on that part. There were a few periods and phases of reduction in violence, but not, unfortunately, um, over the Afghans. The reduction of violence is more meaningful when you look into the numbers of international military forces coming under attack. There has been a significant reduce in attacks over internationals. So with such situation, and of course, the, fact, the other factor here is the COVID-19 situation. Probably it's out of the existing, you know, conversation on how uh, the COVID-19 crisis is dealt with in Afghanistan. But unfortunately, the implication of that 
has also affected the, the overall uh, peace process in how to sort of speed up the, the process to come into an intra-Afghan dialogue, which is the next immediate stage. What we don't see here is uh, a, a dialogue directly happening uh, between the Taliban and the Afghan government and the rest of the political leaders on prioritizing the ceasefire. We don't see any sort of serious attempts towards that, despite the call from the people, despite the call from the nation. Uh, and also uh, uh, what we are sort of expecting in the next few uh, weeks or uh, hopefully not months is an immediate uh, launching of this conversation and uh, coming to an agreement on an immediate uh, demand for ceasefire because the violence is taking lives every day for a kind of a war that is not a choice for anyone who is losing their lives, whether young, old, rural, urban, everyone is affected and every part of the country is affected, unfortunately, in this war. So what is needed in terms of the way forward, I think, is um, uh, to do with national you know, political elites being pressurized by the civil society as well as by the international partners to come up with an agreement or to come up with at least you know a team that they can go and represent afghanistan and discuss uh you know um their need uh the dire need for ceasefire uh, with internationals i should also highlight there has been quite a number of sort of competitions going on in terms of who takes the ownership of this process as we move ahead in terms of facilitators in terms of guarantors in terms of you know actually hosting uh, there are regional um, countries partner to Afghanistan or allies to Afghanistan who are offering their help to host this peace talks. There are also other countries uh, who are offering this, this as well. Although it's not openly spoken about, but one gets a sense that probably there is also this little bit of a competition, if I may call it, between these different international actors who try to sort of also have a kind of a more salient role in this process of um, taking over. So more or less what I see here is some sort of uh, lack of uh, seriousness from the Afghan elite side because they prioritize power holding and power sharing over people's lives, which is really causing us a lot of you know damages. And also I see regional and uh, in global level competitions in terms of you know facilitating this process. As, aside from this, uh, it's very difficult to sort of have a clear understanding that why, despite a U.S. Taliban being signed in February, and now here we are in July, no movement, no further uh, steps taken in terms of, you know, at least moving ahead with the intra-Afghan dialogue and a ceasefire as a result of it. Uh, I will just stop here with the follow-up conversations. Thank you. Graham, you're you you're on mute. Okay. Just a moment here. Graham, can you hear me? Uh, Graham, can you hear me? All right, then uh, I think we need to move on. Uh, so if I can turn to Nahid uh, to speak about the, um, at the economy and then Tobias to follow Nahid. A very good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much, Nigel. Um, it's a pleasure to be in company of uh, my colleagues here today in this panel. I hope, uh, Everybody can hear me well. Um, Nigel, I'd like to start from year 2014, uh, the year 
which was the start of the transition period, where the economy um, dropped down, but then it picked up. Um, I think government in Afghanistan in general had good progress despite security challenges. Um, the economy um, and growth increased from 2.9 percent, uh, uh, from 1.7 percent in 2015 to 2.9 percent in 2019. There was significant increase in revenues, um, and that 2019 saw um, the biggest number in terms of revenue collection. Um, today, um, Afghanistan budget uh, is financed 49 percent um, by its own revenues. Um, there has been significant increase um, in exports. Only in 2019, for example, Afghanistan hit $1 billion in exports, and trade deficit has um, um, decreased um, to some numbers. Um, and we cannot ignore um, such progress, and there have been great strides made in many other areas. However, um, there have been many challenges. And affairs um, have been more complicated with the outbreak of pandemic, as you said at the beginning, in, um, and also uncertainty about the peace process. Um, starting um, from the situation of people, poverty rate, which is already as high as before present, um, is expected to decrease um, this year, um, and we might not know next year um, how the situation would be. Um, and it might even get close to 70 percent, um, which is um, a very significant number. Uh, there will be a significant um, fall in growth rate um, and also drop in revenue um, collection. Um, at the beginning of the year also, we saw a um, uh, drop in revenue due to border closure, also lack of demand and um, uh, impact of services in Afghanistan due to COVID in, in peace, um, and also political uncertainty about peace, which affected investment in small business generally. Let's also keep in mind that each year around 400,000 Afghans enter the job market. That's a huge number, and government is fully under pressure by the return of refugees. Um, but um, also, if, if we see the post peace deal scenario, there will be um, addition to the number of people who would want services from the government. It means government needs to expand its role in, um, in different areas of Afghanistan, offering more services to people, to host communities, and also to, if a peace um, deal is, um, um, has come to an end, uh, uh, there will be more, uh, more demands uh, and ex-combatants who will enter the job market, but also um, in certain areas will demand services. It means it will put a lot of pressure financially um, on the government, but also in terms of service delivery, where government already has very limited options of financing. Um, Afghanistan is still dependent on aid, although the dependence on operation budget has decreased, but in terms of development, it is still dependent on international and foreign aid. Um, and given that scenario, that international commitment, aid commitment, will um, um, expire this year. From uh, the last commitment conference we had was a Brussels conference. Uh, so there's a need um, to rethink about how these resources will be uh, will be used. There also have been many talks about uh, declining aid. Afghanistan will not enjoy the amount of aid that. Um, um, it used to in the previous years, for example, in 2010 or 2011, where there was a peak in terms of uh, aid um, um, receiving. Um, and in a nutshell, I would like to say, um, as you alluded at the beginning of the 2020 November conference, both government and international community need to make very hard choices and um, need, to, uh, need to make cautious um, 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 uh, Choices in what will be the areas of investment, if um, um, the, in the current scenario, I don't think will be much sustainable for long. Thank you so much. Tobias, thank you. Yes, um, I, I think that was an excellent summary of the current economic situation from uh, uh, Nahid. So I, I don't actually have a lot to add. 
What I would say, I think, really is that um, the big picture is that Afghanistan's economy has been growing too slowly to really reduce poverty uh, since at least 2012. So even if we have 3 or 4% GDP growth a year, when the population is growing by about 3% a year, we're barely making progress. And, and because of that, we've seen the poverty rate increase from 38% uh, roughly in 2011-12 all the way up to 55% in 2016, 17. And we think during uh, the COVID crisis, that number could reach as high as 70%. So um, we're going in the wrong direction in terms of poverty, even with this stable three, 4% GDP growth rate before the COVID crisis. Because of COVID, we now think the economy will contract by about 5% in 2020. Uh, and the pace of the recovery really depends uh, in terms of the, the pace of getting the pandemic under control and the broader international conditions. So the, diff the recovery is going to be difficult. It's going to take time. Um, there aren't big new sources of growth ready there to be mobilized. Um, and, and I think a lot of the businesses that have closed down during the pandemic um, they're not necessarily going to be in a hurry to reinvest and, and um, put new money into an economy where there is such great uncertainty. Uh, so forward looking, um, you know, I, I think what that really means is from an economic perspective, when you're talking about a peace agreement or a, a transition again in Afghanistan, um, people talk about a peace dividend. They talk about um, how peace will be uh, some kind of key to growth. Uh, obviously, if we if we really eliminated violence and, and achieved broad security, that would certainly help growth prospects. But starting where we are, um, we are in a very uncertain position. Uh, it will be very unclear what that future growth trajectory is under any circumstances. And, and I think that as Nahid has laid out very, very well, um, uh, really a lot depends on the extent of international grant support. Uh, Grants are funding 75% of public expenditure. They're funding 90% of security expenditure. The trade deficit is over 35% of GDP. So we have imports of roughly $7 billion, exports of about $700 million. So a huge gap there. Uh, and, and really without the grant support, uh, this is gonna be a, a very difficult uh, situation to recover from. So uh, we, we were in a fragile situation going into COVID. Uh, we're in an even more fragile situation now due to the economic impacts of the pandemic. Uh, and that pathway to recovery is, is uncertain and will require consolidated action and support from the development partners. Thanks, Tobias. Uh, Graham, you're online again now, I think. Um, uh, perhaps we could just circle back and ask you to um, give us a sense of, of what uh, you see coming up in the political and peace process sphere. I thought that as usual, Dr. Sarabi gave a, a, a very uh, sweeping tour d'horizon, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite a rigorous overview of the political situation. I, I might just add uh, to her summary that, um, you know, the status quo is terrible. Um, and so the prospect of disruptions to the status quo uh, could be quite negative or it could be, it could be positive um, in the sense that uh, over the last uh, 15 years that I've been covering Afghanistan day in, day out, um, you could predict what was going to happen next with a fair bit of certainty. Uh, there was going to be more bloodshed the following year. That was a very safe and easy and un unfortunately, always correct uh, prediction. Um, and now, as we come up to these inflection points that you've just described, um, the levels of uncertainty are really quite high. Um, we don't know uh, whether we'll get through the last few hundred prisoner releases and get to uh, talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban as uh, planned uh, in Doha. Uh, it was their plan for July. They probably will be pushed into August at least. Um, when the donors come to uh, this uh, meeting in the fall uh, to plan um, assistance for Afghanistan, you know, they come um, under conditions we've never seen before uh, with the global pandemic and stress on aid budgets uh, in all contexts around the world. 
Um, so these, you know, the, the levels of, of uncertainty are much higher than ever before. Uh, but, you know, um, there is a possibility of ending the bloodiest war on the planet Earth. Uh, last year, 1,000 people, by one count, were killed in battle in Afghanistan. That's more people killed than in Syria, more than Iraq, more than in Yemen. Uh, and so, you know, the possibility that um, you might end up with peace talks um, is uh, an optimistic thing. Um, I think major steps have been taken um, over the last two years that get us closer to peace because um, as uh, Dr. Um, Orzal noted, you know, they the have been very short, very fleeting reductions in violence and ceasefires so far, but we have never seen reductions in violence or ceasefires of any kind uh, over the last two decades. Um, and uh, we now know that uh, we can achieve those by negotiating with the Taliban, that uh, there is actually an address uh, for the insurgency, um, that the, the political team uh, uh, has an ability to influence the violence on the ground. Um, and the, that the opposite is also true, that uh, when the commander in chief of uh, the Afghan security forces, uh, the president uh, gives an order um, that all of the uh, pro-government factions uh, stop fighting on his command, um, which was something that was in doubt uh, for some analysts for some time. Um, and so that has, uh, those baby steps have really brought us towards this moment now where we merge of historic peace talks that will, for the very first time, bring the two sides together. And uh, yes, that does uh, raise the level of difficulty for donors to, in terms of planning. Um, because if you're talking about, you know, on budget support for the government, you have to think, well, which government, you know, exactly who are we meant to be supporting? Uh, and so it, uh, I've been doing a bit of reading recently about um, how political transitions are managed in the United Kingdom, for example, where senior bureaucrats uh, have to speak to the official opposition uh, and also to the government about so you can maintain uh, continuity um despite sometimes pretty radical political change uh so the, the challenges are greater than ever before but sort of the opportunities uh graham thanks and, and actually that what you just said leads into the next question i had uh which i will ask uh ozala to start off with and then you to 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 add anything you'd like to um and that's this question of potential power sharing um, with the Taliban. This is obviously something that is on uh, both Afghan and international policymakers' minds. It's surrounded by a great deal of uncertainty. For sure, uh, the Taliban do have um, a researchable track record in terms of how they have been administering or shadow administering areas that are under their control. But the extent to which that serves as a predictor for how they would behave either as a partner in government or as a dominant partner in government uh, is unclear. Um, and I would like to, um, to ask uh, Ozella to this very difficult question of, of uh, whether you think power sharing is indeed a feasible proposition and if so, what might it look like? Thank you, Nigel. Um, just, to, just to follow up from, uh, from our earlier discussion, I believe, I mean, in, within the context of Fragility Forum, there are two factors. One is the political power sharing side of the things. The other is service delivery and how to make sure that the people across the country who are in need of these services can have uh, access to services. Power sharing hopefully will result in ending violence. This is our hope and desire for the last throughout my life, you know, for the last four decades, we would say. Uh, and then the service delivery is something uh, just to sort of touch upon as uh, um, uh, two other respected panelists were mentioning about uh, Nahid and um, uh, Tobias. Uh, on on, the, uh, on the, the importance of delivery of services, I would like to just have a quick point and then I come to power sharing. And I think the history of Afghanistan over the years of war shows that in the absence or in the uh, in the situations where governments have failed to deliver services, which were also the case pre-2001, 
the non-governmental organizations have been quite actively engaged in, in filling that gap and filling that space. And I'm not sort of advocating now to immediately shift to that because there, uh, there has been a lot of changes and a lot of, you know, um, uh, uh, um, issues have also emerged with uh, NGOs taking over the government role of service delivery, but there is something to, in terms of an emergency response or a phase until we reach to a level of uh, relative stability as uh, opposed to what we have now status quo that as Graham said it's not ideal of course in any way or form is some kind of an emergency arrangement to make sure that a we can manage to keep the NGOs uh, accountable and b to make sure that they are able to deliver services so I hope the bank and the rest of the international development partners in this context of extreme depend donor dependency that we've really failed to address across you know, all, all throughout all these years, we can consider some sort of an emergency situation where an arrangement is being made between, you know, the Taliban, the government and the non-governmental, you know, uh, 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 organizations to, to prioritize, you know, delivery of services, because you're right, there are shadow arrangements by the Taliban, but uh, let's just, you know, look into how much is actually reaching to the people, because the Taliban are also taxing indirectly, if not directly, uh, the, the service delivery uh, sort of sector by, for example, taking taking money from the teachers. They allow teachers to go and teach in the schools, but they make sure to have a percentage of their salaries. This is the story from Ghazni or probably also other parts. Now, in terms of power sharing, as I said, we are really doomed in the sense that everyone wants the full uh, share of power or maximum part of it. Uh, this is the case, unfortunately, with the political elite in Kabul who enjoyed, you know, a kind of a very enormous amount of funding that was received through international contracting business and all that. Uh, and also through, you know, other illicit networks from drugs to which we, you know, have, you know, thorough research and studies about my organization is doing a lot of work on drugs, um, ARU, uh, and that shows how much everyone is earning. And these everyone is including the Taliban, but also including some powerful, you know, uh, figures that are probably affiliated, not necessarily with the insurgency in the Taliban, but also are part of other networks, including those in power. Uh, so there is that illicit economy activities that is really sort of significant. And it's also uh, fe feeding this whole, pro uh, this whole, you know, situation of war and violence ongoing. Within this context, um, I think the only two sources of hope could be a stronger pressure from the local communities, from the local civil societies, who are unfortunately also are getting a little bit into politics in Afghanistan in terms of, you know, the similar ways of competition over whose voice is more important than the others and so forth. But there is a need for sort of more mobilization of the, the people to, to, to have a stronger voice towards peace, both voices towards the violence that is happening against the Taliban, but also the voices against the violence that is happening by the government, which is also an unfortunate reality. The intensification of violence is not one-sided. The Taliban cause violence, the government responds through violent attacks, which is also causing you know, civilian casualties and everything. So in this context, um, ways of potential power sharing, there are possibilities, but to the extent that we follow the, the, the developments uh, from all sides now, what we can say is that everyone is quite uh, high and at a peak of, you know, their desirable solution, which is maximum level of power and authority in their hands. The government is having red lines. And some of these red lines, obviously, is shared also by the civil society and others. Some are probably very particular government red lines. And the Taliban also have red lines. And it's it's just, I did, uh, there, it's very hard to see any evidence towards actually reconciliatory messaging and communication businesses or PR businesses, because both are intensifying their verbal and also their practitioner or actual uh, sort of uh, approaches towards war and violence as opposed to, to peace. Uh, and that really puts us in a challenging uh, time to be able to really uh, foresee a, a realistic picture of how power sharing would look like. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Graham? Yeah, as, again, as usual, I think uh, Dr. Nemet has offered you uh, a better story than I possibly could, but 
I would just add that, you know, in my previous uh, capacity as head of domestic politics for the United Nations political mission in Kabul, um, I heard a lot of maximalist, uncompromising rhetoric from various different pro-government factions who uh, swore that they could never get along with their rivals and that they were the only legitimate representatives of the people. Uh, and then, you know, the next week uh, they made a deal and they worked together, um, sometimes worked very well together. Uh, you know, Afghan politics is quite dynamic. Um, this kind of rhetoric um, is, you know, often does not of, of future cooperation. Um, in effect, um, when people ask, can we share power with the Taliban? I always answer, well, you are sharing power with the Taliban. The Taliban, you know, as, as very well documented by um, Dr. Nimitz's own AREU reports or uh, Nigel, your uh, ODI reports, um, you, you know, the Taliban govern uh, part of Afghanistan. They hold power in part of Afghanistan. Um, I've seen uh, studies suggesting that the population they govern is about the size of Cuba's or the size of Belgium's. You know, they, it's millions of people uh, living under Taliban rule. Um, it, the idea, uh, I think, is that we need to have uh, one system rather than two. Um, and, um, you know, I think it might ultimately be in the interest of both sides to have um, less friction along those uh, dividing lines uh, between zones of governance. Um, and I, I really don't see it as being impossible. Um, fundamentally, um, a lot of the uh, power holders within the pro-government uh, camp don't have um, fundamentally different political and economic interests uh, as compared to the Taliban. Um, there are deals possible, I think. Um, it's going to be difficult and messy and will require a lot of uh, pressure from the international community. But um, everything I hear from both sides, um, these so-called red lines are, I think, more rhetorical than actual. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, let's move on to, to the next question. And this is more specifically drilling down into questions of uh, international assistance, and in particular for, for this particular forum, uh, development assistance. Um, we've heard already uh, how dependent uh, the state is and will remain in the near future um, on external assistance. Um, I think that's clear to everybody that the stability and viability of any form of state uh, cannot be separated from continued significant uh, infusions of external assistance. Um, Tobias, I'm going to ask you to speak to what you see as the prospects for that, uh, and also um, what you feel has been learned uh, about the in, in the last two decades of external assistance, and how that could be harnessed into uh, a more efficient a more productive form of, uh, of aid provision. And also the extent to which um, foreign assistance uh, in the future uh, is likely to be able to influence uh, either Taliban policies and behavior, which is clearly a subject of, of uh, much speculation in policy circles at the moment. So Tobias, if you'd start in the, with this, and then I'll ask, uh, Ex-Deputy Minister Sarabi, to follow you. Thank you, Nigel. Um, as, as you say, I mean, we are coming up to a, a critical moment for, for Afghanistan. Uh, we have been one of the most dependent countries in the world on aid for the past 20 years. Uh, and we're now in a position where uh, there are questions being asked about future assistance, both on the security side and on the civilian side. So just to put some, some rough numbers around that, uh, Afghanistan has 30% of its GDP uh, is the size of the security sector. So it's a massively oversized security sector uh, that compares to an average of 3% of GDP for other low-income countries. Uh, 
Um, so it, it's unsustainable, it's unrealistic to expect the Afghan state to be able to sustain that kind of security spending on its own. Uh, and as I've said, on the civilian side still, uh, about half of government funding is being provided by donors, uh, half, of, half of civilian programs being financed by, by international partners. Um, we're coming up to a kind of critical decision point with the 2020 pledging conference. Um, and there are big questions being asked. I think it, it's very fair to say this is almost a perfect storm. There's a, a lot of political uncertainty. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty around the future uh, peace agreement with the Taliban. And then there is an international economic crisis being driven by the, the COVID situation. Um, what does this all mean? Does this mean that the, the, the grants are going to disappear? I don't think so, and I certainly hope not. Um, but I think that what this puts a lot of pressure on is for the government to be able to demonstrate going into this process that it can deliver reform and that it's serious about making sure that donor funds are, are better used than they have been in the past. And, and I, I don't think there's any real way around that. Um, obviously, we, everybody recognizes the difficulty of the context, but, but there have been clear messages coming from the main development partners for a long time that the levels of corruption that we see, the levels of, of misgovernance that we see, are a real constraint to the continued provision of, of, of international support. Um, so so I, I think really what we need to be doing is structuring a conversation where the government can say, please tell us what it is that we need to do to mobilize continued support. Uh, and and uh, the development partners can then be very clear and, and they can provide that support in a way that is explicitly linked to performance, it's explicitly linked to the reforms that the development partners need to see. But I think that communication is absolutely critical. This can't be uh, ad hoc, it can't be ex post, it has to be basically an agreement up front saying that these are the measures that need to be taken to um, assure the ongoing support of the international community with all parties being very clear about that. Um, you know, I, 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 and I think, you know, again, just to put some of these numbers in context, I mean, $5 billion for, for Afghan security sector, uh, mostly paid for by the United States. It, it sounds like a lot of money, but, but if you compare that to, for example, the overall U.S. defense spending, whereas you, I think in the range of $700 billion, this $5 billion a year really does not come across then as, as a massive investment in terms of the impact that it can have and maintaining state stability, maintaining a viable state, uh, continuing to support an economy that we've been working to uh, sustain, working to strengthen over the past 20 years. So, so these are big numbers, there's no doubt about that and, and the international community is in a difficult position with many competing claims on resources. But uh, in the grand scheme of things, and in comparison to the investments that have already been made over the past 20 years, it's really important that we sustain this investment. And I think that there can be no doubt about the gains that have been achieved through development assistance over the past 20 years. If you look at school enrollment rates, if you look at infant mortality, if you look at immunization rates, uh, pretty much all of the social indicators uh, fertility rates falling, all the rest of it, we've seen these development gains really improve, basically due to the provision of international assistance through a functional government that's been led by a, a mixed capacity, but with the capacity, demonstrated capacity to deliver. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that's really the, the, the point, is that we have shown that with development assistance being provided in the right way, through the mechanisms and institutions that have been built up over the past 20 years, we can support real development gains that lead to improved living standards for Afghan people. And I think what's really important is we make sure that that gains are sustained, that support is provided uh, through real communication about what needs to happen to maintain those gains on both sides. Nobody is saying uh, that the international support will continue at current levels forever. 
I think we're, there is a general understanding that international sport needs to decline over time and Afghanistan needs to move towards self-reliance. The real question is about the pace of that decline, making sure that it's realistic and making sure that it's staged in a way that expectations are clear on all sides. With that kind of uh, trajectory, a gradual downward uh, trajectory of, of international support, the gains can be sustained. If we're looking at a rapid reduction in support over the short term in the middle of an economic crisis and in the middle of a potential political transition, the risks of losing the gains over the past 20 years uh, are enormous. Um, your final question on, on influencing the Taliban through, through international assistance. I think that is a, a critical question and I think that's one that many in the international community in Kabul are thinking about. Um, the critical element to me, and I think this comes back to some of the things that, that Dr. Nimat was saying as well, is that ultimately power brokers on both sides will be making their own decisions and their own calculus. Uh, and any peace agreement between the Taliban and the, uh, the broader Afghan society will not be determined by international partners, it will be determined by Afghans, and, th and that is as it should be. But I think uh, what is going to be very important is that the international partners make clear what their conditions are for ongoing assistance and make sure that the Taliban understand that if they uh, wish to take a hard line on certain ideological issues that are of concern to them, it will come at the cost of reduced international support, which will have a, a real impact on the living standards of Afghans uh, under a government that they are moving to, to take a, a stronger role within. And I think that will have very clearly acknowledged implications for, the, for their legitimacy, for their capacity to govern. So that is to say, um, I don't think anyone really knows what the extent of our leverage would be uh, or, or um, how receptive the various parties would be to that kind of discussion. But what is very clear is that the discussion needs to be had uh, and again, the expectations need to be realistic about the kind of international support that could, could be provided under various permutations of an Afghan government, including a greater role for the Taliban. Let me stop there. Uh, Nigel, we, I can't hear you for some reason. Yeah. Um, Minister Sarabi, would you like to uh, follow that up, please? Thank you. Um, as a follow up on what the survival is very uh, nicely constructed, uh, let's see uh, aid and also peace, like equally, they are struggles. Like we know, there's a problem. We can't have overnight and have the timing to paper. Um, the same thing with any development process. If you think that there will be a sudden drop in pace, that's not a problem. I say you have to see it again. Um, and in the past, there, you have to see the uh, what. Um, I would like to refer to my observation um, on overall state. Um, one thing that we have learned, uh, we have seen, although there has been a decrease in aid, um, 46% from 2010 to that, uh, 2011, which was the case year since today, there has been a lot of difference between what was pledged to Afghanistan and what was committed and what was really dispersed and when in terms of services to people or to the government or to NGOs and so forth. Um, sometimes it's, uh, this scenario, uh, this trajectory, it's, uh, raised a lot of expectations. Like that we talked about $15 to $16 million when it came to disbursement of more than $20 to $15 million, uh, which needed further explanation. A lot of people, especially people of Afghanistan, always um, ask themselves. Um, this needs to be really 
communicate as well, I think, in the next coming years. Um, we, we really need to build trust between the uh, government people and also the international community who are uh, speaking in terms of aid and what has been financed and implemented, I think there was um, a level or some some level of um, or lack of discipline and realism and prioritization on both sides, from the international community and also from the government. Um, in 2010, 2011, there was a lot of aid that was found. And if you really thought in terms of such a line, uh, investments could have been made in areas where it's Turned a lot of revenue and created a lot of jobs for, for Afghan people. So it's um, in the next years, Afghanistan wasn't that much dependent. Um, although we don't um, ignore some, a lot of achievements for them. Um, the next level I want to allude to would be um, a, a, a project approach rather than a pro programmatic. And also uh, relates to my second point. Uh, in terms of prioritization, that the aid could have been turned in bigger programs rather than um, small projects and such subjects of interest here and here, which in um, many areas created parallel structures. Um, the other issue, which was also very important for um, both governments and international community, and that was an um, international commitment of um, having more aid on budget. Um, although there has been a lot of achievements in this area, we have to refer three percent um, on budget support um, um, compared to 12 percent in 2010. Again, uh, in many documents, there was a commitment of at least 50 percent where it was never breached. Um, although there were conditionalities for putting on budget, and sometimes it was due uh, to lack of um, capacity or institution capacity of the government, which has um, um, change or um, develop, uh, progress and change. Uh, but sometimes these conditionalities um, weren't really um, putting this point for emphasizing on institutional um, or long term. And in many um, areas, but we really make, make at this point very clear that even in any political system, and let's say, uh, uh, not only with Taliban, but even in, in 2020, after the election, where there was a political settlement, um, some of the reforms um, were a little bit at the state conflict. So um, when, when it comes to conditionality, we really need to see that these reforms are really institutionalized and our point um, are very important. The next thing which also refers to the role of NGOs in civil society, most part um, it was, I would say, principal agent problems from a There are a lot of aid went to areas where people in the capital didn't know if it was the service of people or it was really expensive the way. So these are the areas that we really look into as we go ahead in the next um, year. And I like said at the beginning, um, since there was decline in aid, so it really needs to be transition in an area where there is priority for the government um, and for, for the people, that's most important. Um, and um, and it's it, on a tough build trust between government and people. Um, role of NGOs are, are crucial. They, they have been our heroes when in the past couple of years provide services. But when it comes to <coughs> top government, then it really needs to be government, and no matter who, who leads the government. Is that they have the legitimacy and they have to be accounted to. Um, on your second point, uh, of Nahid, Nahid uh, yes. we're having a bit of trouble hearing you, and we're also reaching the end of our time. So, if you'll allow me, I'll just uh, move on here, um, and I'll sure. just ask before we wrap up. Uh, I'll ask um, uh, Dr. Namat and then Graham if they have any thoughts. Uh, about the, these questions of international assistance and uh, uh, possibility of influencing Taliban policies and behavior. Um, if you have a few comments you can make on that, and then I'll bring the session to an end. 
Thank you, Nigel. Very quickly, although I have uh, just mentioned my remarks in this uh, regard in terms of, you know, the emergency nature of uh, prioritizing delivery of services. What I say first, uh, as we speak, the humanitarian organizations on the ground are already talking to Taliban and they are also, you know, having their access level sort of talks and negotiations with the Afghan security forces. So as we speak, this is something that has been happening and is happening. And, and I, I hope that would not be mixed uh, with with the political processes that we are talking about in terms of, you know, the, the Taliban structures and governance and all that, uh, because uh, with due respect to the research being done on that part, I find it a little bit too sophisticated to imagine for an insurgency group to have such very le regular level of, you know, governance uh, mechanisms in place. Uh, I know there are ad hoc arrangements on the ground, but not necessarily very highly sophisticated. Uh, I think the priority, if from the humanitarian perspective, the priority should be that while we predict clearly that there will be more violence and there will be an intensification of violence, unfortunately, then we have to also prepare to make sure that people on the ground can have access. So one option, as I mentioned, would be this, you know, arrangement between governments, uh, Taliban and and the non-governmental sector to see how that could be filled. Uh, but more than that, I would just leave it to, to Graham probably to, to sort of um, explain uh, from their point. Thank you. Graham? Uh, Graham, we can't hear you again. Having problem with the connection. You hear me now? Yes. I was just going to say I strongly ag agree with Dr. Nima that donors should consider a, a sort of emergency footing for their assistance um, in the upcoming round. I mean, a lot of the uh, development thinking around Afghanistan has been uh, exceptionally long term, you know, um, dreaming of the construction of pipelines and energy corridors, et cetera. And those are all very good plans. But look, in the short term, um, you are still dealing with the world's biggest war. Uh, the number of people dying of COVID um, is difficult to estimate, um, but it is uh, exceptionally high. Um, you know, the, the, the humanitarian needs in Afghanistan may go up uh, in the short term. And um, one of the advantages of uh, humanitarian assistance is that it has these sort of principles of um, impartiality and neutrality um, that might help the donors to navigate a very politically complicated situation uh, while uh, the Taliban and, uh, and the palace uh, try to hammer out some sort of new government structure. Um, so yeah, um, high level uncertainty and I think Orzal is right that, um, that we might need to figure out sort of bridging mechanisms um that that get us from here to there thank you um i'd like to to actually add a word of caution there i think that there may indeed be a tendency for donors to feel uh, safer in financing what they would see broadly speaking as humanitarian types of activity uh, and that could lead uh, if misapplied to um to the neglect of, of critical functions of the state. Um, I think that, that uh, Graham, you, Dr. Nemat, everybody have laid out the unique nature of the challenge that donors face as they come up to uh, these pledging rounds uh, later in this year. But I think that um, uh, they also need to, to bear in mind the costs of allowing uh, the state to degrade and wither away under whose ever governance it, it might be administered. Um, as we all know, um, aid is a strange hybrid uh, of self-interest and altruism. And so perhaps uh, it's, uh, it's useful to appeal not only uh, to the reputational cost and moral obligations that donors have of continuing to support a place with which they are so heavily identified, uh, but also to, to ask them uh, to look at their own self-interest uh, should the state deteriorate further. And I'm talking here about 
large numbers of refugees, uh, continued export of narcotics, um, and uh, exportable extremism, if I can put it in that way. So there is a very strong self-interest uh, that everybody has uh, in preventing um, a degradation of the state. And, and hopefully uh, that uh, will be, um, donors will focus strongly on those issues uh, as they look for what will have to be quite unprecedented and innovative ways of financing, uh, particularly over the next three to four years. Uh, nobody, I think, denies uh, that uh, there is going to be uh, some kind of diminution uh, in aid from the extremely high levels uh, that have been reached in previous years. And much of the planning um, anticipates that uh, and indeed welcomes it. Uh, there is plenty of fat that can be cut from wasteful and corrupt programs that have, if anything, undermined the governance of the state. Uh, as long as there is a rational and predictable um, decline in assistance uh, over the next four to five years. Um, so let us then leave you with that. Uh, we've overrun slightly. Uh, we apologize for some of the connection difficulties we've had today. Uh, and we hope that this has been helpful to those of you who uh, are engaged and will remain engaged uh, in Afghanistan in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we'll call it a day.